All right. Well, today we want to continue our discussion of Armstrongism. And as I mentioned y'all uh, last week, that's not something I'm real familiar with. I don't know that I've ever had a conversation with somebody that claimed to be an Armstrongite or whatever. But uh, we got through most of it. And we said one of the biggest things that they seem to espouse is the idea of the British people, and by extension, a lot of the American people, uh, being descended biologically from the Jewish race. I had, uh, had one of my um, coaches, we got talking about this uh, before practice the other day, and uh, he was saying, yeah, you know, the Jews said he wasn't familiar with that either. He said, certainly the Jews have been scattered worldwide, no doubt about that. A lot of Jews that live in Russia, and there's been uh, pogrom, not, we talk, think about the, uh, the Holocaust in World War II, and the, what the Germans did to the Jews living there, but uh, the Russians did some of the same things to the Jews in the 1800s, uh, Jews living in Poland. You know, Jews live all over the world, so we're not, not talking about just the Jews being scattered, but again, they seem to be saying that, okay, the e English people are descended from this, these lost Jewish tribes seems to be a, a big part of what they uh, espouse. Um, again, we were looking at the, that some uh, last time. All right, so this the seventh point, the bell called us, and we were looking at this last time. And here's a quote from, again, their uh, literature. Jesus Christ will not sit upon the throne of David until his second coming, yet future. And I told you this is not just a, an Armstrong deal. I've talked with others and denominations say, well, Jesus is not ruling right now. He's going he's to rule when he returns. He's going to return. He's going to rule for a thousand years in Jerusalem. And beyond how many scriptures that contradicts, as I think I mentioned, y'all, to me, that's sad. The people are going through and not realizing that Jesus is the king right now. He's the king right now. He's the king of kings and Lord of lords right now. He is reigning right now. Somebody says, well, he's, people are living in rebellion to his rule. Sure. We've been studying in our um, school Bible class, been looking at the book of Psalms. I was reading this morning, matter of fact, in Psalm 45, 46, 47, it talks about the Lord being the king. And again, that's not talking about future tense. That's talking about right now. He is the king right now, regardless of if people are living in rebellion to that rule or not. So this is what Brother Jennings said. And again, we read some of these passages the last time. The kingdom of God promised to both Israel and Judah is the church. And Christ as head is now reigning over it upon the throne of David. Jesus now reigns. And we're looking at some of those passages. And again, some of y'all alluded to that last time. We think about the, uh, again, I think the prophecy of, of uh, Daniel in Daniel 2.44. Talking about the kingdom that would be established in the days of these kings, the Roman kings. And how it's described, said that that kingdom, that kingdom that would be set up and last forever, would break in pieces, and it would scatter and consume all these other kingdoms. That's exactly the nature of the church. The church exists within the physical nations, the governments of men, but it's there to hopefully, influ hopefully influence government in a positive way and influence rulers in a positive way. Jesus is the head of that body. So again, he is ruling right now. All right, we read, I uh, just want to pick a couple pieces out of uh, Acts 2, 29 through 33. Uh, in the context, Peter has just quoted from Psalm uh, 16, uh, verse 8 through 11, talking about the fact that Christ will be raised from the dead. And he's saying, men and brethren, y'all know that David, is, he's dead, he's still buried. He can't be talking about himself. He's talking about Christ. And he makes this uh, point, talking about David, therefore being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he'd raise up Christ to sit on his throne. So again, David was prophesying of Christ reigning and ruling. And you remember the, the closing statement that Peter makes in Acts 2 and verse 36. He said, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that this same Jesus, that God has made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both the Lord and Christ. Not he will make him, but right now he is, he has made him Lord in Christ. And again, when you look at the word Christ, it means the anointed one. So we talk about Jesus Christ. And that's, that's biblical and scriptural. But you also could say King Jesus. He's the king right now. So when we say Jesus Christ, we're saying we're acknowledging he is the king and he is the king now. 
Uh, in Acts 15, uh, here, James at the big conference in Jerusalem, he, uh, he alludes to what Peter had just said, and then he quotes from the book of Amos, and this is the passage he quotes, and uh, James is saying this passage, this, the things that are happening in their day, in that generation, is the fulfillment of this prophecy. So here's Amos 9, verse 11 through 12. It says, In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen, and close up the breaches thereof, and I'll raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old. So again, David's kingdom would be built up when? James is saying, right now in his generation, this was happening. It says that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all, of all the heathen, heathen, which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doeth this. And in this prophecy, it's implied that the Gentiles will be a part of this thing. The heathen would be included in this great kingdom that would be built up. And that's the verse that uh, he quotes there. Romans 10, 11 through 13. It says, For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Again, whosoever. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all. He is the Lord of all. Now, whether somebody makes him the Lord of their life or the king of their life is a decision. But the fact of Jesus being the king over all and the Lord over all right now is a fact. Whether somebody accepts that or not, whether the atheist accepts that or not, Jesus is the king right now. He's the Lord right now. Whether they make him the Lord of their life is a decision. It says the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So again, there's something on our part. We have to receive him. We've got to allow him to be the king and the Lord of our life. But the fact of him being the Lord of the earth right now is a fact. Acts 13, 30 through 34. Uh, Paul preaching at Antioch of Pisidia says this. But God raised him, Jesus, from the dead, and he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. Talking about the apostles. And we declare unto you glad tidings, the gospel, the good news, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, and that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And when you look at Psalm 2, that entire psalm is prophetic of Jesus. And talking about the, uh, is kind of the, the way it's uh, worded is interesting. It talks of the rulers of the world plotting against Jesus and not accepting him. And then he ends it in verse 13. He says, uh, kiss the son, lest he be angry with thee. So again, the idea of worshiping him, acknowledging him, uh, they were, that was up to them. They had to do that. But he's the king right now. It says, thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. Now, it's concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption. He said on this wise, I'll give you the sure mercies of David. So again, the idea of those promises that had been made were being, had been fulfilled and were being fulfilled in the church being established in those days. Revelation 2, 25 through 27. But that which ye have already, but that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, Tim, I will give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father. And so we see the picture in the book of Revelation of Christ reigning, and by extension, his people reigning. So again, Christians, there's a the Bible talks about us being priests and kings as well. So we have authority uh, in the world today as well. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 28. Then come at the end come at the end of time, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. This is going to happen when he comes back. He's going to deliver the kingdom back to the Father. What does that mean? He has the kingdom right now. The kingdom is in his power right now. When he shall put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign. He must reign. It means he's reigning right now. So he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. That will happen in his second coming. For he hath put all things under his feet. When he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest or as obvious or made shown that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. But the Father being an ex uh, exception that rule. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So again, that indicates that Christ is reigning right now, and there's a time where he's going to turn that back over to the Father. All right, uh, point number eight. 
prophecies of Old Testament for the 20th century primarily. Whereas that's their teachings. And again, they're not alone in this. I've, I've talked with many people, and I, I know that y'all have too. They talk about the prophecies uh, of the book of Daniel and the prophecies in the book of Isaiah and all those things being fulfilled right now. I think I told y'all I had a discussion with a, um, a parent email discussion. We were talking about this in Bible class six or seven years ago. And in Acts 2, where uh, Peter is preaching to the crowd and he says, these things that you see and, and heard, this is the fulfillment of Joel 2. So these things are being fulfilled right now. And I was telling the class that and had a, uh, actually had a, a mom that emailed me and said, oh, no, 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 no. Those, those things weren't fulfilled then. They're, be, they're about to be fulfilled. They're being fulfilled now are about to be fulfilled. That's not what Peter said. He said that those things are being fulfilled right then. But there's a lot of people with that mindset that they, those prophecies is just for us. And I think they make the same mistake uh, as in the book of Revelation. And there's just some things in Revelation that may apply to us. Could be. There's a whole bunch. I think most of the book of Revelation, as y'all believe, has already been fulfilled. Has been fulfilled through uh, the last couple of millennia. And Jehovah's Witnesses are big on Old Testament. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. So Brother Jenny's response in Acts 3.24. This is uh, Peter talking to the crowd after he sealed the lame man. You remember the lame man that uh, looked at them, was expecting some money, and said, Silver and gold have I none, but such I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I say, arise and walk. And so he's explaining and talking to the crowd, and he says this. He says, yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. So the days of Peter and the apostles was the beginning of the fulfillment of all of these things, of what Jesus did, the establishment of the church, and the, the kingdom growing. Acts 26, 22 through 23. This is Paul talking before Agrippa and Festus. It says, Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer, and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead, and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. So again, what is Paul saying? The things that Christ, that happened to Christ, is the fulfillment of those things that the prophets from Moses on discussed. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. I've heard uh, Brother Joel and, and Israel talk about this, and I never had really lo looked at that like they pointed out. I thought that was uh, a great point here. Jesus went to God in heaven to receive his kingdom. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the ancient days. I, I, again, I'd read that a few times. I, I didn't read that real clear, carefully. Oh, well, oh, that's talking about Jesus uh, coming back to the earth. And that's not what it says. That's Jesus going back to the Father when you look at this. One like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days. And they brought him near before him. So Jesus coming near before God. And remember, the uh, apostles, as they saw uh, Jesus carried up, they saw him carried up in the clouds there in Acts 1. It says, There was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages, I think here's one of the keys, should serve him. That's true today. That's been true for the last 2,000 years. Everybody on the planet should serve him. Whether they do or not is a decision, but they should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, in his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. The same prophecy is made in the church. It's what Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It is going to last forever. So you say that Christ received the kingdom after his resurrection? I think that's the idea. That's the point that I've heard Israel and Joel talk about. What was that point? That Jesus, uh, when, he was, uh, when he was raised, when he ascended, it says, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient days, that that's when he received the kingdom. The kingdom was placed under him. The uh, kind of the, um, the idea, I think there's nine passages in the New Testament that talk about Jesus sitting at the right hand of God. So he's sitting at the right hand of God. First Peter 3, 22 talks about, uh, again, at that point, all powers and authorities and everything being under him at that point. So that did the kingdom being given to him at that point. Other thoughts, questions, comments about that? Yeah. <clears throat> Christ told Peter upon this rock I will build my church. 
but didn't, that didn't necessarily mean right this minute. Right. In the exactly. Exactly. Kind of like uh, Mark 9 and verse 1. Where it says there be some of you standing here that shall not taste of death until you see the kingdom of God come in power. So it was right on, on hand. You remember what uh, John and Jesus were both saying, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Is is right here, is about to come. So uh, I think the fulfillment of that was when he was raised. You think about when he ascended to heaven, which you got a, a week or two later, where Peter preached that first great gospel sermon. And so you had the establishment of the church there in Acts 2, after Jesus has ascended to heaven at that point. Kind of how to look at that. All right, so Acts 1 and verse 9 says, When he had spoken these things to the apostles, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Which again, that's interesting. That's just how Daniel talked about it. One like the Son of Man came with the clouds uh, to the Father. Interesting point. All right, another one that Brother Jennings has under this. Luke 24, 44 through 48 the main body of prophecy focused upon Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection in the preaching of the gospel. So here's, again, Jesus, when he is speaking to the apostles before his ascension, in Luke's account it says, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled. All things must be fulfilled. All right, what, Christ? What are you talking about? Which were written in the Law of Moses and in the Prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me, everything was written about me would be fulfilled. And I, I don't know the exact number, some of y'all might, but I've heard people say at least 300 prophecies of Christ we find in the Old Testament. Every one of those were fulfilled to the minutest detail. It says, Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written, And thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance or remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. So Jesus says the things that happened to him were the fulfillment of those prophecies that were made there. And again, with the establishment of the church, that fulfilled a myriad of other prophecies that were made uh, in the Old Testament. Isaiah 2, 2 through 4, is one that our Brother Jennings mentions. The parallel, a sister passage that is uh, Micah chapter 4, about 1 through 4 is almost verbatim unto this prophecy. It said, It shall come to pass in the last days, the last days, the Christian dispensation. Remember the Hebrew writer talked about, talking about Christ hath in these last days. So you and I are living in the last days. The apostles were too. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. That's the church. It shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. Well, what's the church look like today? It's filled with people from all over the world, of all types of nationalities, ethnicities, uh, etc. It says that many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So the church will be established in Jerusalem, which we see fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. So again, he's going to judge among the nations. The church would uh, filter out throughout all countries, throughout all the world. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Now, the nations don't follow that, but the church does. The church is supposed to follow that. Uh, throughout history, you've got uh, people like the, the popes declaring war, the crusades, and that sort of thing. That's not what the church is all about. The church is not about uh, physical swords and weapons. Our weapon is God's Word. And that is what we use to prick people. Hebrews 4 and verse 12 talks about that two-edged sword. And I've heard preachers talk about that, that, that word cuts you going and coming. And I love that illustration, too. All right. The, I think this is the last point that Brother Jennings makes on the Armstrong tradition. The Sabbath and the law are still binding. The Ten Commandments are the way to salvation. And we've talked about others that hold on to that same view, that you, you've got to obey the old law. Isn't that what Paul was dealing with in his writings and in his teachings? That's what the book of Romans is all about, Galatians, Hebrews. We're not under the old covenant. We're not under the old law anymore. But that Armstrong tradition, that's a part of that. All right, so we've talked about several of these when we talk about the seven-day Adventist. 
And he, I'm not going to look at all the passages we did before, but here's a couple that Brother Jennings mentions in this context. 2 Corinthians 3, 4 through 14. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. He's given us everything that we need. We can't add to it, can't take from it. He is all we need. Who, talking about God, also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. So you and I are ministers of the New Testament, the New Covenant. Not of the letter, and that's talking about the old law. Sometimes people talk about the uh, spirit of the law versus the letter of the law. When they use that uh, term, for the most part, they're talking about, when they talk about the letter, they're talking about the old law, the spirit of the law being the New Testament. Not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, to my, the Old Testament was glorious, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? It's about the New Covenant. For the ministration of condemnation, the Old Covenant, be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. The New Covenant exceeds that. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, but reason the glory that excelleth. The New Covenant is far superior to the Old Covenant. We read that in the book of Hebrews. For if that which is done away was glorious, the Old Testament, much more that which remaineth is glorious, the New Testament. Seeing then that we have uh, such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel cannot steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. The Old Covenant has been abolished, but their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. How plain is that? That veil was taken away. The Old Testament was taken away. Again, we've looked at um, uh, Colossians 2.14, uh, Ephesians 2.14 through 16. We're talking about the same thing, that middle wall of partition that was taken down. All right, Colossians 2.13 through 17. And you, Gentiles, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, made you alive, raised you from the dead spiritually, having forgiven you all trespasses, that's what the New Testament is all about, getting forgiveness of sins. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which is contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. What was the handwriting of ordinances? The old law, the old covenant. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink on respect of unholy day of the new moon, of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. And again, the point, and I've missed this for years, but the point he's trying to make is, I don't let somebody judge you for not keeping the old law, for not observing those things. Don't let somebody judge you for that. All right, and that's that. Y'all have any questions, comments, anything regarding Armstrongism before we leave that? All right. Well, we will get into today the next topic. We're looking at the charismatic movement. And there, there's some overlap on this with this and the Pentecostal movement. So the char, uh, charismatic movement, and Brother Jenny has discussed this a little bit, is not necessarily, is not just a a particular denomination, but a lot of these ideas have filtered into uh, a number of different churches, even the Lord's Church in some places, but especially some of the denominations. You've had some of these. So th there, some of the things they espouse are similar to what we looked at with y'all uh, recently in that, in that lesson. All right, so the history of the charismatic movement. There have been resurgences of the practices characteristic of the charismatics throughout history particularly centering around a second grace experience, which follows conversion, identified by them as baptism of the Holy Spirit and accompanied by speaking in tongues. I think, Brother Lord, you were talking about this. This is really sad. So many of them aren't sure if they're saved or not. You know, if I'm waiting for the Holy Ghost to come on me and have to have that happen before I'm right with God. This new wave of the old practice of ecstatic utterances is not confined to minority religious sects, 
but it spread from the early 1960s through Protestantism and Catholicism even. So saying this idea, this is a, an idea that has spread in not just one theme, but into a lot of different areas. We could say that Pentecostalism spilled over denominational lines when Dennis Bennett, rector of St. Mark's Episcopal Church in Van, Van Nuys, California, experienced what he called baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gift of tongues. The movement has touched the lives of individuals from nearly every educational, economic, and cultural background with several million adherents claimed in the United States alone. A prime force in the education and popularization of this movement is the FGBMFI, the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship International. And, and so again, Brother Jenny is looking at this chronologically. This was kind of the next movement that really uh, came about at that point. This organization has grown from a small beginning in 1952 in Los Angeles to many thousand adherents, always boldly advocating ex experimental religion with emphasis on Holy Spirit baptism and speaking in tongues. The thrust of the movement has been accelerated by spectacular claims of flamboyant personalities through multi-million dollar television ministries. Healings of all uh, kinds are claimed, lengthened legs, straightened spines, cancer removed, even puppies raised from the dead, washing machines healed, empty gas tanks miraculously filled, and one lady reported having given, been given a new belly button. So all those things are, are interesting that those things are occurring, isn't that great? The washing machine got sick. <laughs> That's a good question. It was interesting, the idea of uh, cancer being healed. Uh, I don't know if that means the Democrats are uh, charismatic. I was reading the uh, Democratic platform, and one of the things in their platform for this year is uh, we're going to destroy cancer. So that's one of the things that they're promising their platform. So I don't know if they have charismatic leanings or how they plan on doing that, but y'all be glad to know the Democrats are going to, they're going to cure cancer. All right, here's the next one. The need for spiritual warmth has done much to foster the movement, as has a lack of vibrant Bible study in Orthodox established denominations. The Jesus movement in the 1960s led to this movement in a great part as younger people were looking for brotherly love to replace dead ritual and traditional hangups. Here they could participate, cry, testify, get help, and hug. Emotions, commitment, warmth, excitement, love, and enthusiasm characterize the charismatics contrasted with the funeral type services, as they say in many churches. The early church was never intended to be a mental mausoleum. You know, and it, it, I'm old enough to remember, and, and even, even today to some degree, but I remember when I was growing up, you would, uh, people I talked to at school, uh, they would talk about, well, give me, give me the man and not the plan. And y'all have heard people say that. Give me Jesus. And what they're saying is, well, I want Jesus, but I don't want anything to do with the church. And so it's almost kind of that same idea behind this movement. This organiz uh, organization, this full gospel organization, now operates in 83 countries through th 2,700 chapters meeting weekly or monthly. It publishes Voice Magazine, read by 3 million people. Demos Shakarian, a dairyman, is founder and president of this organization. All right, so again, as we say, this is not necessarily like one religious group, but this is a uh, kind of a uh, philosophy that has spread into a lot of different areas. So number one that Brother Jennings mentions of the charismatic tradition. So this is their, their idea. Christians are still receiving by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, direct revelation from God when teaching, preaching, writing songs and books, and when making decisions. For example, Bill and Gloria Gaither's secretary said concerning their song, The King is Coming, that song has been a gift from God, came quickly to them. They feel that to dissect the song would be tampering with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit who inspired the song. And I don't know that I remember that uh, particular song, but that's a little bit of an arrogant thing to say, I think, to say that kind of indicating that God gave me uh, this song. The Bible is not our final source of God's revelation. That's their view, and very similar to what we talked about a while back of the Catholic belief, the Catholic teaching that uh, the councils that they had, uh, the decisions of the Pope, carried just as much authority as what the Bible says, uh, what the apostles said. So it's kind of the same thing. And again, they're not alone in, in feeling this way. Uh, let me see. But the Bible is not a final source of God's revelation, but simply a witness to additional revelation that He has given today. 
Well, what does God's word say? Well, we know what it says. God put his words in the mouth of the Old Testament prophets. For instance, uh, Jeremiah 1 and verse 7. The Lord said unto me, Jeremiah said, Say not, I'm a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. So Jeremiah, I'm going to give you the words. Jeremiah could say that honestly, that God gave him those words. Daniel could say the same thing. Isaiah could say the same thing. All those Old Testament prophets could say the same thing. All the prophets of the New Testament could say the same thing. Men today can't make that same claim. Verse 9 of that same passage. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. So again, when we're reading the book of Jeremiah, yes, it's the penned words of Jeremiah, but it's the words of God. It's the word of God. And so any of these uh, any of the 66 books of the Bible, you could say the same thing. Ezekiel 3 and verse 4. Ezekiel had a similar experience. And he, God, said unto me, Son of man, go, get thee unto the house of Israel, and speak with my words unto them. Ezekiel was speaking the words of God. Ezekiel wouldn't have said some of the things that he said on his own. Ezekiel wouldn't have done some of the things that he did if God hadn't told him to do that. God asked him to do some I think, what was it? One time I had to lay on his side for many, many days. But uh, there's things that he told him to do that he wouldn't have done on his own. But God told him to do those things. In that same chapter, Ezekiel 3, 10 through 11, Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, all my words that I shall speak unto thee, receive in thine heart, and hear with thine ears, and go get thee to them of the captivity unto the children of thy people, and speak unto them, and tell them. Thus saith the Lord God, where they will hear or where they will forbear. And it goes, you'll remember in that um, text in Ezekiel 3, he talks about Ezekiel being a watchman. And the responsibility he had to share what God told him to do. He said, Ezekiel, if you tell them to repent and they don't, okay, well, that's on them. But you've delivered your own soul. If I tell you something to tell them and you don't warn them, I'm going to judge you. And so that's kind of the context of this. But again, you see, God is saying, I'm going to give you my words. Brother Jennings adds, the faith of Christ was once and for all delivered to the saints. Amen. The, we're talking about the faith, the points to the one and only system of doctrine. That's the one of faith, brother. That's exactly right. That's the one that survived. Yes, sir. And we're told that the word of God comes by hearing. The faith comes by hearing the word of God. So, yeah, word so, yeah, that's so it's, it's the faith. We it's hear that. One. Jude verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. It's not being continually revealed to us today. It's been delivered once and for all. Yeah, that's the brethren word, man. That's all we got to live by. Galatians 1.23. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. And the context of that is when Paul had first come to Jerusalem after his conversion in Damascus, about three years later. A lot of people didn't trust him. They called that Barnabas had to kind of smooth the way for him to, to be able to come into the fellowship there. But it says he preaches the faith. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. Paul says, the Holy Spirit has told me this directly. I'm sharing this with you. Then in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So some would, it, the faith is something that can be departed from. Brother Jennings says, any new doctrine or revelation is false, and its bearer must be rejected. In 2 John verse 9 and 10. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speak. Amen. Brother Jenny says, There is no other gospel. Any who proclaim anything different are cursed. We're told in Galatians 1, 8 through 9. And you recall in verse 6 and 7, Paul says, I marvel that you are so soon moved from the gospel into another gospel, which is not another. He says there is only, there is only one gospel. There's not two gospels. The gospel, the faith. That's right. 
Galatians 1, 8 and 9. But though we, or an angel from heaven, if an angel claims to tell you something different than what I've told you, but though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we are preaching to you, let him be accursed. Amen. As we said before, so say I now again. He emphasized the point. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Amen. Paul had preached the one gospel. They had received the one gospel. He says anything else is not the gospel. Genesis Smith didn't believe that. Yes. He, he, he believed the angel from heaven. Yes. Well, That's exactly right. <clears throat> Brother Jennings mentions uh, this. This is something I've run across in my studies in uh, world history. Uh, Martinus. Martinus in the second century claimed the church had spiritual members who followed him in his direct revelations from God and carnal members who only had the dead letter of scriptures. The charismatic movement of today is neo martinism Roman Catholicism also claims an open-ended revelation for her hierarchy, as do many other leaders of Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventist, Sun, Moon, 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 Children of God, Herbert W. Armstrong, etc. Many people that we've studied so far, they claim that, oh, God has given me something that He didn't give everybody else. And it's, it's just sad that people blindly follow individuals like that. But Martinus, uh, the, the, the point that he's making here, and Martinus isn't the only one you can find throughout history, not just even modern history, but throughout history, uh, people that have claimed to have some extra uh, revelation. All right, two, Brother Jenny says, in the charismatic tradition, anyone who questions tongue speaking today or other aspects of the charismatic movement is condemned and lined up with the Pharisees who criticized Jesus and accused him of doing his work by the power of Satan. And uh, Abby uh, was talking to me the other day about a conversation she had with uh, one of her high school friends, and they got to, to talk about some of these things. And so she was talking to him, and I've had the same experience, and y'all have too. But she was talking about, well, here's what the Bible says. And, let's, does, and so, again, their idea is, well, boy, you're, you're being a Pharisee. People have no clue what they're saying when they talk about, oh, you Church of Christ folks, you are Pharisees. Well, what did Jesus condemn the Pharisees for? In Matthew 23 and verse 2, he says, Whatsoever they bid you do, that do. For it says the Pharisees, they say and they do not. So Phariseeism is saying, speaking a good game, and I won't do it. That's not the idea of espousing, let's do it God's way. That's not Phariseeism. That's, that's a common uh, criticism that you and I receive from time to time. All right, Matthew 12, 22 through 31 speaks of the sin against the Holy Spirit. No one questioned the miracles Jesus did, not even his enemies. They didn't question he had done the miracles. They didn't want to give him credit for that and didn't say it was, came from God. So Satan is the one that gave you that. It is a gross misapplication of the scripture when charismatics accuse those who question the authenticity of their claims of miracles as opponents of the Holy Spirit. Many devout Christians doubt or deny the authenticity of modern signs and miracles. And does not the Bible in 1 John 4 and verse 1 and other passages, does it not say uh, to, to test the spirits, try the spirits where they're of God? We're told to do that. If somebody is honestly, authentically speaking something that God has told them, shouldn't they want people to investigate it? Because if you investigate it, you say, oh, okay, that must be true. Why do they want people to investigate it? Because they know it's not true. They know it's a lie. Three, if Jesus baptized with the Holy Spirit yesterday, then surely he will continue today and tomorrow. Again, that's a quote from some of theirs, and they're using Hebrews 13 and 8. This said Jesus Christ the same uh, yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13 8 does not say or imply that Jesus will always do what he ever did. He created the world, but doesn't continue this. During his personal ministry, he did not speak in tongues. He once inhabited a body, uh, but shall, uh, shall know more today or tomorrow. God's law has changed, Hebrews 7 verse 12, but His truth, integrity, love, etc. never changes. He died on the cross once, but does not continue to die again and again. So again, the point is there's things that Jesus did do that doesn't continue. The old law is another example of that. Well, we, as we just talked about a moment ago under Armstrongism, we were under the old law, or mankind, at least the, the Jews, were under the old law. That's not the case anymore. 
concerning gifts, they were not to continue forever. And we've shared that with you before. Hebrews 13, 8 is distorted by charismatics who force a meaning which established rules of hermeneutics uh, will not allow in order that they might justify their contention that tongues, miracles, and healings are happening today. And this idea, uh, Dad talked about this, uh, I've heard him talk about this several times, 2 Peter 3, 6, uh, 16, where uh, Peter's talking about the writings of Paul says, some will twist to their own destruction. The scriptures can be twisted. Uh, they can be manipulated and used for all purposes. So here's the passage, Hebrews 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is. He continues the same. Again, sometimes he gives different directions. It's like even you think about God. I think it's um, Malachi 3 and verse 6, where God says, I am the Lord, I change not. Well, think about this one example that comes to my mind. You recall that uh, Moses was told on one occasion to strike the rock. He did. Water came forth. Remember, a second occasion is told to speak to the rock. Well, God, it sounds like God changed. Well, God didn't change, but He changed what He told Him to do. Remember, Moses did it the same way He did before. Uh, God wasn't too pleased with Him, was He? Kept out the promised land for that. So God's direction, sometimes He does, throughout history, He has given different directions. Brother Smith, He expects them to be specific. That's exactly right. That was the point of that. That's exactly right. Yeah. We can't question what He has said, Kim. No, we got to obey and we have That's a great, choice, that's exactly right. Great point. 2 Corinthians 5, 16. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yet though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Not in that way. You and I are not going to see him in the flesh again. We're going to see him in the spiritual body one day in the resurrection when we have our spiritual bodies, but he will not have, inhabit this flesh and blood body anymore. Hebrews 7, verse 12. For the priesthood being changed, there's made a necessity, a change also the law. So again, to my God being the same, yes, but has his law changed? Yes, it has. He has changed his law. He has changed his directions from time to time. Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin into salvation. And there's another passage in Hebrews that says he will not die over and over and over again. He doesn't have to be offered over and over again. He did that one time. 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 10, uh, that uh, Brother Jenny is alludes to here that we looked at uh, a few weeks ago. Charity never faileth, love never fails. But where there be prophecies, the supernatural prophecies, they shall fail. Where there be tongues, they shall cease. Where there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, and that which is in part shall be done away. So those were temporary things. They would not abide as faith, hope, and love would. They were temporary in nature. So those things were not to be carried over unendingly. But thank you as always for your good attention and good comments.